This is Steve Hooksbuster in Washington. Because of interest in the previous two excerpts, today on Military Monitor, we present the third section of testimony from the National Veterans Inquiry into U.S. War Crimes Policy. Organized by anti-war Vietnam veterans, the inquiry took place the first three days of December 1970 at Washington's DuPont Plaza Hotel. The Washington meeting was preceded by similar hearings in 13 other cities and heard testimony from dozens of discharged Vietnam veterans. Active duty military officers were present to hear the testimony, and it is possible that they will attempt to bring military charges against top-ranking officers as a result of the inquiry. In the past, the Secretary of the Army has dismissed such charges. It was the contention of those who testified that it is those at the top who are responsible for the acts which they committed and witnessed. They view the men charged in connection with the events at My Lai as scapegoats. At the hearings, the press, audience members, and other members of the panel were permitted to question the men testifying. At this December 1st session, we heard Michael Ewell and Richard Dell, both veterans of the AmeriCal Division. My name is Michael J. Ewell. I was a first lieutenant in military intelligence. I was assigned to the 11th Brigade the first military intelligence team of the 11th Brigade of the AmeriCal Division in November of 1968. And I'd like to just state briefly about two, uh, state, uh, make some comments about two points uh, as far as military intelligence behavior in Vietnam is concerned. They are the, uh, the systematic use of electrical torture and Beating and brutalization of Vietnamese non-combatant detainees by uh, United States troops and military intelligence personnel, and also the general reliability of any information gathered by the military intelligence. Let me reverse the order and talk about the reliability first. We created the mythology that we had in my unit a 62% reliability factor. Because we would, we would pay people, we had a net in our counterintelligence section. Uh, we would pay people to come in and give us information that we could never verify. Now this information was used if we felt it was relatively re reliable. In other words, if we felt that by going out to an area that was populated, we might at least find a rice cache or just rice, period. We would try to interest an infantry battalion into reacting. However, most of the time, our information reports were used as input to artillery barrages, harassment and interdiction, uh, B-52 raids and strikes, and other air strikes. Uh, at the end of the day, the artillery liaison officer or the air liaison officer would call us up and say, give us some coordinates. We have some ordnance that we must expend. And so we would give them the coordinates of uh, populated areas, in many cases, uh, and they would use these to fulfill their fire missions that evening. Specifically now about electrical torture, I witnessed myself, I was the... Uh, the team chief, and as such, I, I, I worked in both counterintelligence and also in interrogation and order of battle. But I witnessed not only in the interrogation section, which was located on the base camp, but also with the counterintelligence agents, uh, counterintelligence agents out in the field, the frequent use of electrical torture, uh, uh, implementing a, um, or using the the TA-312 field telephone, which was part of the organic equipment of any unit, any combat unit. Now, this was used, uh, this, the, the wires coming from this, uh, this telephone were bared and attached to the sensitive parts of, of detainees' bodies. Uh, I witnessed personally uh, it being used on fingers, primarily, also on ears. And uh, the crank was turned, and it gave out a charge. Now, in one case, I saw a young girl who was detained by an infantry unit brought into the 11th Brigade base camp, and uh, 
brought back into a bunker at the interrogation center. And she was electrically tortured to the point that she menstruated and fell to the floor. Uh, in the field, I witnessed uh, a young boy and an old man who were detained after an aborted operation. We were sent out there to look for a cave uh, where there's supposedly some uh, uh, Viet Cong activity. And two people, this old man and, and a young boy, were detained on their way from their rice field. It was evening, and they were bringing their water buffalo back to their hooch. Now, in the presence of two majors, the XO and uh, an engineer uh, advisor to the 1st of the 20th, which was the same battalion that uh, Lieutenant Colley was in, incidentally, uh, these two young boy, I'd say about 12 years old, and uh, the old man, I'd say in his 60s, were both pistol whipped by American CIA agents uh, using 38 snub nose revol uh, revolvers, and uh, they were electrically tortured. I'd say both of these men were gravely injured. Electrical torture at the 11th Brigade base camp was used on a daily basis. Uh, on people who were generally classified as innocent civilians uh, at the termination of the interrogation. Uh, often these people were removed from their lands and brought into the, uh, uh, at a great distance from the 11th Brigade, which was located in Duck Fo, and then they were just turned loose at the gate and told to find their own way back to their lands. Now, many of them were also classified as civil defendants. In fact, there was tremendous pressure from our, our headquarters, from the colonel, to classify people as civil defendants. These are people who we were supposed to determine had uh, in some way violated Vietnamese law. None of us were qualified, in fact, to interpret Vietnamese law, and none of us really spoke the language. However, we were to determine if people were draft dodgers or in other, way, or in other ways had violated the law. Uh, if they were, many people... Uh, many charges were drummed up because of the pressure, and many people were, were classified as, as civil defendants who would otherwise have been classified as innocent civilians. There was tremendous competition among the brigades to see who would have the largest number of civil uh, defendants. It's uh, significant to note that we didn't, the reason there was such pressure to classify civil defendants is because we very rarely got bona fide guerrillas or NVA troops. And uh, I would say no more than a handful of people were classified, actually classified as possible prisoners of war uh, the entire time I was in Vietnam. Now, these people that were classified as civil defendants went through a cycle of torture. They're, they were picked up by the infantry units, mainly uh, in most cases because they were present in their villages at the time a sweep was going on. They were brutalized by the infantry, brought in, electrically tortured and beaten by the MI, turned over to MACV after they were classified uh, as civil defendants, where they were again put through beatings and torturing, and finally turned over to the National Police, where they underwent another series of tortures and beatings. After, uh, uh, after this, they were either thrown into their already overcrowded jails or released. All right, are there any questions? Can you talk about the cycle, of, the cycle of torture beyond your point and in advance of your point? When you were in the MI unit and uh, the prisoners were brought to you and then sent off to MACD, how do you know about what happened to the main to MACD? Yeah. Well, often uh, I was out in the field and witnessed the brutalization of, of people out in the field. Many times people came into us already bruised and told us through interpreters how they had been brutalized in the field. Now, in MACV, we turned the people over directly to MACV, which was located some 500 meters outside of our front gate. And we had very, very close liaison with MACV District Headquarters, Duck Fo. And we also had very, very close liaison with the National Police Chief and, his, uh, and the National Police in Duck Fo. So we often witness these. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of policy you were giving uh, as to the people you were giving, I mean, writing, or...? No, this was de facto policy. It was uh, 
I had heard about it when I was in military intelligence training in, at Fort Hollaberg, uh, off the record. Uh, after class, you'd go up to the instructor and say, oh, what's it really like in Vietnam? And they'd tell you about prisoners being thrown out of helicopters and, and uh, 312 uh, uh, field phones and batteries used uh, to electrically torture people and other, other more, uh, other torture techniques, uh, none of which I ever witnessed, water torture, bamboo, etc. And uh, when I got to Vietnam, these SOPs, standing operation procedures, had already been established in the unit. But there were, there's nothing in writing. There's no, no, there's no, no uh, directives or manuals. That always getting uh, pressure from uh, the Air Force and people like that for targets. You know, they actually would call you up and say, we have some ordinance we have to extend. Could you elaborate on this, this whole theme of, of, of the late? Well, the, the, uh, I know that there was, we had a, an ammo, uh, a, an ordnance dump at the 11th Brigade headquarters, and that every several days this was uh, replenished, the stock was replenished. So they had so many, so many rounds of high explosive, uh, 8 inch, uh, 105 and 155 howitzer rounds that they would have to expend within a certain period of time, because the convoy would be going back to Quinion to resupply, getting the stuff off the docks. It was, Cycle right back to the United States. Was there ever any uh, competition or any kind of, uh, quote, you know, we've got to fire so many shells, we've, we've got to beat the other guys to fire so many shells, that sort of stuff? No, I, I, I don't know exactly even what the number of shells were that they had to fire. But there was a surplus that they were trying to spend. Yeah, by the end of the night, they would try to get uh, some targets. If they didn't get targets from the infantry units out in the field that day during their sweeps, they would come to us in the afternoon for. Them. Like a, a military intelligence team would rather use the artillery to get them because then they were intelligence right or wrong. So we could never verify whether our intelligence was right or wrong, except uh, one or two cases where we did go out and find a rice cache there. Or other. And I, I suspect that was more by coincidence. Uh, we call it the of the people as well. Oh, very definitely. Uh, created this kind of policy. Are there people responsible for this? Is this something that grew up as a practice and everybody was following? Well, uh, all of these, uh, some of the uh, the uh, tactical field policies that do exist are subject to uh, euphemistic uh, coverings, so like a free fire zone, search and destroy. These uh, uh, pacification, relocation, all of these things have been known to the American public for years. And uh, they're like problem. They just take them down at the uh, evening news. Uh, I guess they couldn't figure any any way to cover up electrical torture, and so it just never. Uh, it, they never created an, a nice a nice euphemism for it. But it has been going on since uh, uh, 19. Uh, to my knowledge, 1963. We have a man that testifies seeing it 1963 in Special Forces. Um, can you tell me how you knew the two men who just hit the CIA? C C I agent. Counterintelligence agent. Is this uh, uh, electrical torture uh, capricious, random, uh, or was it expanded with uh, every detainee? Uh, we had a, I would say the interrogation section of my team worked an average of 12, 15 hours a day. There was swamp. The infantry would just bring in Oh, 20, 30, 40 detainees a day, mostly old men, women, uh, girls. So, uh, I, w I would say, uh, I would have really no way to estimate. I would say it was used probably on a daily basis, uh, since I was, I was the administrator for the team, I was in present in the interrogation center at all times. So, uh, but I would, I wouldn't say it was used on every one of the 40 during the day. But it was used on a daily basis. It was a matter of policy. No, I did not see it every day because I was not the interrogation officer. I had an XO who was the interrogation officer. No, I never did keep a record. I never, uh, we, uh, the, the rationale at that time uh, was that, well, it didn't really hurt them. That's uh, what. That's the way we uh, we sort of uh, brushed it off. Well, it's something doesn't leave any marks or anything, and it's part of the policy. And what can we do anyway? 
The uh, the interrogation officer. The, you could not classify as any, anybody as a as a prisoner of war unless he was captured with a weapon. Mike, I, I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to yeah. to move on now. My name is Richard Dell. I served with Company B, 1st to 6th Infantry, 198th Light Infantry Brigade. I also served with 1st of the 1st Armored Cav. There are both units attached to the Merrick Cal Division. Uh, I could tell of many things, many small instances, but in the effort to save time, I'm going to say a few of the things what I thought were more outstanding. Uh, myself, I never saw a large-scale massacre of anyone, but I was witnesses, witness to a few incidences of uh, slaughter of civilians. I can know of one instance where we went in on a CA into a village. It was a hot CA, meaning uh, the first lift of choppers caught fire, and uh, they received fire from an NVA. I guess you might call it a squad, approximately seven people in uniform with weapons as good, in my opinion, better than ours. Uh, when we went into this village, we, uh, I was in the third lift, which means the third group of helicopters to come in since they can't land everybody at once. They bring you in at different lifts. And uh, by the time I got there, the uh, firing was over, the firefight was over. And the uh, company was pulling what you might call a sweep or search and destroy in that village. During this time, we took all the civilians and uh, herded them into a, a central area so that they could be interrogated. Uh, we completely ransacked every hooch in the village, uh, turned everything out, all their valuables, any uh, boxes or anything that they might have had were opened and looked for ammunition or anything in it. One round of ammunition was found in that hooch. It was burned. And it was sort of a practice that if you didn't find anything, most people carried a round or two of uh, enemy caliber weapon in their pocket, and they would just throw it in the hooch and then show the lieutenant, say, I, I found this, and burn it down. And at this time, uh, we sent three prisoners back into the battalion to be interrogated further. And then uh, later on, we captured another person. This person, uh, like, there was no more helicopters to take him in, and they didn't want to let him go, so the captain said that he should be gotten rid of. So uh, two people took the person's ID card, which if a South Vietnamese doesn't have an ID card, he's, Vietnamese, he's a gook. Uh, he's B.C. As supposedly any loyal citizen has an ID card. So these two people took his ID card, put it in their wallet, and then told him to take off. And he ran approximately 10 yards and turned around to look to see what was happening because his wife and his child were standing right there. And when he turned around, there was a man with an M60 machine gun, another man with an M16, and they both let him have it. And uh, he got hit with maybe 20, maybe 30 rounds of M60 fire and M16 fire. And... Uh, he was laying there, he was still alive, and uh, the medic was asked, well, what can you do for this guy? So the medic laughed, pointed M16 in his head, pulled the trigger, and then stuck a cigarette out in the wound, laughing about it. Another instance, uh, we were on patrol, and a company approximately two or three kilometers from us received sniper fire. So our patrol was ordered to head in that direction. While we were going in that direction, we apprehended two Vietnamese civilians working in a rice paddy. Uh, they weren't checked for ID. They weren't checked in any way to find out if they were BC or if they were just innocent bystanders. Uh, the lieutenant in charge of patrol said that they should be just gotten rid of and they were shot by the lieutenant and a few other people in the patrol. And uh, I was also in the company which started a thing which is known as a rat patrol where six or seven men will go outside the perimeter at night and roam around the countryside around our night lager. And in that time, anything that moved or made a funny noise was dead. Uh, we were under orders to shoot first and ask questions later. And uh, we would walk through a village, and if any strange sounds were heard coming from a 
a hooch or anything. It could have been people sleeping, just turning on their bed. We let loose. And uh, I know it was pretty indiscriminate because one of my friends was shot by another one of my friends. So he thought he had hurt something, opened up and shot my buddy in the rear with an M16. Uh, Rick, was uh, your company the only company in the battalion or the brigade that used rat patrols? Uh, rat patrols were originated by a lieutenant in my company. He was new in country and he wanted to make a name for himself, so he volunteered us for rat patrols. And uh, one instance, uh, we supposedly had good results, a lot of, you know, reported dead, confirmed body count. So because we had such supposedly good confirmed body count, uh, it was made standard SOP for the 1st of the 6th and I believe other units of the 198th Light Infantry Brigade while I was there. Uh, at one instance, we were outside of an LZ called LZ Baldy, which is a pretty big base camp between Chulai and Da Nang, just off of Highway 1. And while we were there, we uh, were set up in a night logger. And up until this time, we had been receiving a lot of sniper fire, a lot of booby traps, a lot of people were getting wounded and maimed. And we sent out a rat patrol one night, and they went into a village. When they went into this village, it was what you might call a secure village in so much that there was PFs there. PF is popular forces. They're similar to uh, the National Guard. And it's their policy that if they see strangers in the village to ring the bell, the village bell. And the rat patrol was going through the village. The PFs rung the village bell to warn the villagers that there was uh, people roaming about the village. Like, they didn't know if they were Americans or NBA. They didn't know. So as soon as they started ringing the bell, the rat patrol opened up and just split. And then they came back into the night logger, and we called in uh, a 175 mission on the village of about 30 or 40 rounds. And uh, the next morning, we were still set up in the night logger eating breakfast when you might call a delegation from the village came up. There was approximately four or five people that came up under a Vietnamese flag and American flag walking into our perimeter. And they did this in the fact to show that we were wrong in blowing up their village. And they wanted to speak to us and find out why we had did it. And when they walked into the uh, perimeter, they were messed with by the other people in the company. The Vietnamese flag was taken away from one guy. A few of them were punched. A couple of them were tripped. They were just generally harassed. And these people were coming into our uh, our camp to find out why we had destroyed their village when the village itself was only one or two kilometers from a big base camp. And there was uh, troops of the South Vietnamese Army stationed in that village for their own protection. And we had called in an artillery strike. And I was there from... August of 1967 to August of 1968. And uh, during that time, that was the time of the big Tet Offensive where Da Nang, the Marine Regiment Da Nang was overrun. And my battalion was reactionary battalion for AmeriCal Division. In other words, whenever AmeriCal Intelligence had some report of an enemy buildup or an enemy concentration or a heavy attack on a base camp anywhere in the I Corps, we were picked up wherever we were in helicopters and flown to that place. And uh, when we were called in, it was usually declared as a free fire zone, meaning that uh, the man on point, the man work, walking first in the company, uh, whenever he felt that his personal safety was in danger, such as walking across the rice paddy when there was a jungle on the other side, if he felt his personal safety was in danger, then he had, like, permission to open up on the opposite jungle line. It didn't matter if he knew anything was there. It could have been a friendly village or anything. It was just there might be somebody there who's going to shoot you, and you acted on that. Did you pin down some of these uh, places uh, where, the, where you say that the two men uh, opened fire on this? Uh, uh, yeah, well, he had an ID. They took it from him. Uh, it happened in a place called the Rice Bowl. Uh, exact position, I couldn't tell you. I, I didn't even know where I was half the time. It was just 
we're walking 20 clicks this way today and we wake up and, you know, you carry this and walk this way. Look, what was the area of responsibility of the 198th at that time? Uh, anywhere in the Americal zone, it was reactionary. Whenever any, ever anything happened or they suspected anything to happen, it was usually my battalion, a company from my battalion was flown in first. Uh, I would say March of 1968, but that's not a definite date. Was the same time as the uh, just before. before. Uh, I mean, do you know any way it would say General Custer was your CEO at the time handed down uh, you know, this sort of pressure for body count? How did, how did he act? Uh, I don't know. I never saw a general. No, I, well, we were lucky if we, you know, the colonel came out once or twice the whole time I was there. It wasn't considered safe where we were for officers to come out. Uh, the higher officers that uh, usually stayed away. <laughs> yeah. Higher officers didn't have anything to do with any type of combats. So they kind of kept their hands clean, right? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say keep their hands clean, but they didn't. They didn't mind getting us killed, but they didn't want to get killed. Uh, that was an uncommon occurrence, but it was at night, and it's just a general thing. You don't walk outside the perimeter at night. How could you have gotten insurance for a 175 mission on a village where there were popular forces? Uh, we just, the person who was in charge of the rat patrol uh, called it in, said that they had received fire. Uh, there's a lot of supposed tubes. Uh, Captain Mast would like to ask uh, Mr. Dell a question. This is a, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a question that's been coming across my mind through most of the testimony. Is what would happen to individuals such as yourself who would refuse, refuse to do these things, or what the Army calls refuse to go to the field? Uh, well, my company itself, uh, we were at a place called LZ Center, which is sort of divides the Allshaw Valley. It's right on the perimeter of the Allshaw Valley. And uh, we got trapped on top of the hill for three days where we couldn't get out of our foxholes without being shot at. We were up against the headquarters battalion of the North Vietnamese Heavy Armored Regiment. And on the hill complex that we were on, the NBA had 11 53 caliber machine guns, approximately four mortar positions down in the valley, and approximately three recoilless rifle positions down in the valley so that any time any of our men came out of our foxholes, we were being shelled. And uh, it took us two and a half days to get off of the hill. And we went down into the valley and spent a night just down in the valley. And that evening, orders came down for us to go back up the hill. And uh, we as a company refused to go. We just told them to forget it. And as a company, we did this. Like everybody except for the captain and one lieutenant. And the one lieutenant was behind this, but he couldn't refuse a direct order or else he would have gotten 15 years in Leavenworth. But there was nothing they could do to a whole company of us unless they wanted to put the whole company in jail. Uh, I'd say April of 1968. It was Company B, 1st of the 6th Infantry, 198th Light Infantry Brigade. Uh, he called up the colonel and told the colonel that the company refused to go back up the hill and he wasn't going back up by himself. The uh, colonel was sort of pissed, but we went back into base camp that afternoon. Richard Dell and Michael Ewell, both veterans of the AmeriCal Division, Appearing on December 1st before the National Veterans Inquiry into U.S. War Crimes Policy, organized by anti-war Vietnam veterans. This has been Military Monitor. This is Steve Bookchester, Pacifica Radio, Washington.